In this conversation, we're going to reflect upon the law of assumption yet again. Much of Neville's teaching is based on a concept called the law of assumption. The idea behind the law of assumption is what we assume reality to be, if persisted in, will externalize as the reflection of it, be it the experience, be it the circumstance, be it the interaction with another person, be it the environment, and so forth. Now, as we continue on this journey of bringing forth what we desire, we recognize that as we find ourselves in a state of mind that will be ideal, and that's why I was discussing it in the last handful of videos, we find that signs and synchronicities reveal themselves. Now, these signs and synchronicities are distinct to our own interpretation. And based on this interpretation, we guide ourselves to the fulfillment of what we desire to experience. So much so that I want to reflect upon an experience that I had yesterday. So I had a conversation with one of my consulting clients, and he's built his IT business into many millions of dollars a year, a staggering amount, let's say. And he's got a huge team that works all over the globe. And 2020 was a thriving year for him. Now, he contacted me earlier during the year, and we would get into conversations. And then he revealed to me that the reason why he contacted me was because what he wanted to experience from our conversations was hunches and inspirations to maintain that ideal state of mind. Because he was a testament, he is a testament, for someone that finds the answers within, is able to look at whatever shows up on the journey, which may to others be assumed as obstacle, and realize upon maintaining that state of mind, the accurate assumption, the accurate belief, the accurate interpretation of the relationships, the resources, the opportunities that are presented to him and everybody else, and be able to work with that to create success. So that's the whole purpose of our conversations, is for me to encourage that ideal state of mind. So much of the stimulated conversations that we've been having have been contributed by this particular entrepreneur. And we talked about in the last video, maintaining an ideal state of mind. Because as we maintain that ideal state of mind, and we referred to NLP submodalities to help us get into that ideal state of mind, then we find that we already know what we have to do to produce the results. And if it's specialized knowledge, as Napoleon Hill refers to, as in what information you got to learn from this outer world or through somebody else, you will be inspired from within to reveal that information as well as you'll be able to understand it in a way that harmonizes your inner world with your outer world. So this interesting reflection is not only a synchronicity and a sign, but it's also a revelation of how I go about doing things since I committed in 2017 to find flow and get into flow and maintain flow and observe on the day-to-day -day, what are the assumptions which may be from past experiences that I'm assigning to my day-to-day -day experience that deludes me to say that the outer world is breaking my flow, but really the cause is within. And we have the power to change this. Where? In consciousness. So Neville states, that I may not be misunderstood. Let me again lay the foundation of this principle. Consciousness is the one and only reality. We are incapable of seeing other than the contents of our own consciousness. Now this ties very nicely into the law of assumption. Because what it indicates is that because 
we accurately know ourselves, understand ourselves. When it comes to dealing with this five sensory experience, the outer world, whatever it is that is on the journey to the fulfillment of what we desire to experience, we want to encourage accurate assumptions. And these accurate assumptions, when encouraged, when affirmed, externalize as the reflections of those assumptions that have become embodiment to the self-image, changing the concept of self. So we want to see this journey as our own creation and that we want to also realize in the process that we are the ones interpreting it. So thus we have the power to change our interpretations. Realize that so much interpretation as well is subconscious or unconscious. So thus we want to, as Carl Jung put it, make the unconscious conscious. Now there's a world within, a subconscious world, and we are influenced by this world. We have the power to go into this world, interpret what is in this world, understand what is in this world, to harmonize our inner being with our outer being. Thus, be able to reflect in the outer world the opportunities. Even if others don't see it as opportunity, realizing that the interpretation still is from within, and we may be interpreting them as not seeing it, but we don't have to go that far if we don't want to, at least not yet. We can start by applying the law, which is cause and effect reflection, as again discussed in the other video. Cause within, assumption in this case, or belief, interpretation, perspective, and effect in the outer world. Now, as we become more aware, or we call this awakening, we're able to distinctly and clearly able to see more of the cause and effect relationship between the unconscious, the subconscious, and the outer world. This is the journey. And then we realize, as he states here, which is an empowering assumption, creation is finished, and you have free will to choose the state which you occupy. Therefore, it is important to determine the ideas from which you think. So as discussed, we're given the two gifts, speech and mind. And it is said in the Hermetica that if we work with these two gifts of speech and mind, then when we ascend from this life, we'll be taken somewhere, and these shall be our guides. Now, upon reflecting upon this, it appears that where we are right now is akin to a school. We're learning. And the way to learn is to acquire what we refer to as wisdom. And one of the ways to acquire that wisdom is through the integration of knowledge and through the application via experience till we acquire wisdom. Now let's go back to the start of this video where I had this conversation with this entrepreneur. He already knows what he has to do. He's already built a very successful business big team, excellent, and he's well poised for 2021. It was because in the years leading up to this, and he mentioned he started from humble beginnings, during that journey, he was applying this. We talk a lot about Think and Grow Rich, and he reads the same kind of books and has been studying the same kind of information for years. And he applied the principles. And after applying the principles, he acquired the knowledge, the wisdom, the expertise, produced the results. And then he realized that 
Now he's in a place where all he has to do is maintain the state of mind. Well, the truth is this. No matter where we are on the journey, all we have to do is maintain that ideal state of mind. And there's different states of mind. And you define what ideal state of mind is for you. Now, as we maintain this ideal state of mind, we're able to form accurate assumptions about ourselves, about the five sensory experience, which I call harmonious assumptions, which is part of the journey of what I call purification of the mind, in which purification of the mind is releasing aspects or limiting beliefs about ourselves, others, environment, circumstance, on the journey to the fulfillment, to realize that you already are, we already are, all of us are, divine perfection. If we were created in the image of the Creator, then we must be divine perfection. And on the journey, we have assumed certain attributes about ourselves in which we think ourselves to be anything less than divine perfection. So we're presented with an opportunity. The opportunity is to bring forth our desire. Because then the journey becomes as joyous as the destination. Now that's an assumption that I have, which has proven itself many times in equation. And as I go back to the start of our conversation, that ideal state of mind is not something that I discovered and was new when I created my entrepreneurial success, which was the genesis of this channel. That's why I decided to create this channel after in 2013, to share, to discuss, to inspire, and to contribute. But prior to that, I remember when I was 17 years old, and during that time I discovered nightclubs. And what we used to do is we used to go out Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Now, when I was going to the nightclubs, I imagined myself being a DJ because it looked like the DJ was getting all the attention and the DJ was the one that was having the greatest time. So I said to myself, I wanted to be a DJ. And what I did was I went and bought these two turntables, a mixer, everything you need, some vinyl. And I started practicing. And then because I was so in that ideal state of mind, the flow, while I was mixing, all of a sudden gigs started to show up, opportunities started to show up. People would invite me to DJ at some of their parties, house parties. And then I remember one time when I was so, you know, in retrospect, we can look back and reflect upon this. I was so much in this, what we would call the ideal state of mind, that when I was 19 years old, we went to this nightclub and we wanted to go there and it was completely empty when we were there. And right away, I had a hunch that showed up right away. It said, if I can get people into this nightclub, the owner of the club who was wandering around and was hardly anyone in there would let me DJ. And then I put two and two together because right beside it was another nightclub, extremely popular nightclub. So much so that there was a lineup that literally wrapped around the building. It's a big building. So I went up to the owner and I said, if I can get people to come in here and buy drinks, will you let me DJ? Just like that. I didn't think about what to say. I didn't have a business background, no sales or marketing background, just allowed the infinite intelligence to express from me because I had an assumption. The assumption is whatever I put my mind to, I will be able to bring forth. Now this may have been contributed from some of my studies when I was reading the Bible, especially reading the passage over and over again when I was a kid. Go, let it be done, just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. So upon reflection, I realized that that assumption or this belief became a unconscious or subconscious belief. Now I can say it looking backwards, connecting the dots looking backwards. But back to that story. So I said that to him. It just flowed right out of me. And then what happened was he said, yeah, let's do it. After all, he had nothing to lose. 
And so it just so happened to be that this nightclub, the back doors opened up and you could see that lineup. And many of those people that were there didn't know that this other club exists because it was across the street and it didn't have the signage and so forth. And it was a smaller club. And my friends and I, we shouted out to everybody and we were just saying whatever to get them into the club. And they're lining up around the building. It was cold. And then you see this mass exodus of people piling into the nightclub and we had the nightclub packed. And so he let me DJ. And then, you know, he was like, let's, uh, let's talk about it. Maybe you could do more nights here and things like that. But here's the thing. That was something I was very interested in, but it was nowhere to the level of interest of entrepreneurship. So it just proves the equation that when you're in the ideal state of mind, no matter what your goal is, you're able to bring it forth. However, I'm always going to commit to what is my heart desire. So the same principles followed me, except I would forget them, remember them, forget them, remember them, which is why I recommend being in the ideal state of mind until I realized that that's how we do it. So whatever your goal is, recognize that creation is already finished and what you desire already exists. That removes most of the confusion, most of the stress, most of the frustration. And then we recognize based on our assumptions, we're interpreting this five sensory experience. So we can adjust our assumptions within about ourselves and be very free spirited about the assumptions. Release from, as Steve Job put it in his commencement speech, don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. See, what other people think may and can serve them, and those are their assumptions. We have the power to think for ourselves. And what we want is accurate thinking. We want to find what is in harmony with ourselves, our world, because if this journey is our creation and we're the ones interpreting it, then there's inspiration everywhere. Let's reflect back on what my client was teaching us, and synchronistically so, that after bringing forth success after success after success, you're going to know how this works. That's why it's important to stick with one goal and see it all the way to completion and do it again, again, and again. Because then you're going to realize that you already had it within you. So our consulting is about maintaining the ideal state of mind. He does not ask me what to do. He already knows what to do. I don't tell him what to do. I don't tell him what to believe. Because at the stage where he is right now, he values that ideal state of mind is where it's at. And he already knows what to do. The truth is that he's no different than any one of us. He's no different than me. He's no different than you. We might assume in our mind, based on if he reveals his staggering numbers. When I say staggering, I'm not making it to seem that it's on a pedestal. I'm referring to, in contrast, to what many people are earning in business. And it's meant to also, upon tying it together, realize that we're interpreting this all. So we can be inspired by that and say, I'm like him. I can do what he did. I have done it in my past. Even relating to something that I didn't even think about the story about the DJing until we got into this conversation. But there's many examples and you have them. So we stay committed to this. The level of commitment is referred to here by a quote from Bruce Lee. He says, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Pick a goal. See it all the way to completion. No matter what category we put it in, small, big, monumental, see it all the way to completion. You can start with what you would refer to as a smaller goal. And on the journey, you will experience the purification of the mind. You will understand where you are assuming and where you are believing in a way that is misaligned between 
vision and environment. In between, we've got the Robert Dills model, and we focus primarily on the self-image. All that stuff, as stated, reality is both revealing and inspiring at the same time, is revealed to you, and we stay committed. We commit and remain committed till we bring forth the success. Then we do it again and again and again, and the process repeats itself. The reason why we do this is because if we consume large volumes of information and we don't put into practice what we are learning, we can find ourselves identified with mental chatter, overthinking. Overthinking creates an overly complicated state of mind, unnecessary complexity. It is not in parallel with the ideal state of mind, which is one of love and understanding and flow. That stated, we want to reflect then. What are we assuming? And how can we identify with accurate assumptions? Let's talk about this. Harmonious assumptions. So Neville says, As soon as a man assumes the feeling of his wish fulfilled, his fourth dimensional self finds ways for the attainment of this end, discovers methods for its realization. So assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled, that's a state of mind. That's a state of mind right there as far as I'm concerned. That's what he's referring to. And then we've got a fourth dimensional self. The inner world. The divine self. Or whatever term you want to attach to it. That part of you, that intuitive part of you, knows ways that the conscious level of your being may not know. Unless you have brought forth more conscious awareness on those subconscious or unconscious aspects of yourself. Yes. Then you can explain it. Then you can teach it. And then you can articulate in vivid detail. Because certainly, if he wanted to talk about business strategy, then we could talk about lead generation strategies. And I've got lists and lists, thousands of different ways of generating leads. If he wants to talk about converting over to clients, then we can talk about thousands of different ways of converting over to clients, not just from what I was involved with in my businesses and joint ventures, as well as my clients. I have access to all that information. If you wanted to talk about converting clients into a lifelong client relationship and figuring out ways of optimizing, delegating, outsourcing his operations and looking at team building and leadership, we can talk about all those things. It's available. It's there. Because the subconscious has been brought forth conscious. And so we document it. You can create flow charts, documentation, books, manuals, standard operating procedures, which are reflections of experience. Or you could write a book like Principles by Ray Dalio, thick book on principles that he lives by, which were uncovered on his journey. And those are his principles. We may find some parallels in there with our own principles, but this is the beauty of this journey of working with the two gifts of speech and mind. Let's go in within ourselves and find the accurate assumptions, the accurate beliefs, the accurate principles that are in alignment with our true self. And yes, we can be inspired by others. But it is discovered primarily by assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled right now. Not just in the moment in which you affirm it as done and realize it as done. Not just in the moment when you visualize it as done and experience it as done. Not just in the moment when you see the unseen reality in your imagination and assume it as done. But all the time. Because if it was done, then you live in a way that it is done. And I'm not referring to faking it. I'm referring to realization, self-realization. Self-realization is the journey, 
as he states here, of identifying and harmonizing with the fourth dimensional self. Because the fourth dimensional self, that subconscious realm within, can also be understood if you want. And I also believe that that's part of this particular learning experience of life. He says, feed the mind with premise, that is, assertions presumed to be true, because assumptions, though false, if persisted in, until they have the feeling of reality, will harden into fact. And this is interesting. Because assumptions, though false, is not referring to being in denial. It is, as James Allen refers to in the book, The Heavenly Life, shattering the delusions that were our own creation in which we interpreted as fact. And then when we interpret it as fact and believe it to be fact, we continue to see proof of how it is so. And again, we got to go back here when we reflected upon, see this journey as your own creation, and you will realize that you are the one interpreting it. So what are we doing? We're harmonizing the inner world with the outer world through the journey to fulfillment of what we desire to create by identifying any assumptions that we have within ourselves, beliefs that we have within ourselves, interpretations that we have within ourselves, about ourselves and the outer world. And what does that do? Well, what he states here he says you can, by changing your concept of self, interfere with your future and mold it in harmony with your changed concept of self. That's interesting. Interfere. So based on our assumptions, we are molding this reality. So here are some key distinctions that I want to share with you. There's assumptions, and there's even assumptions about assumptions. We can have beliefs, and we can have beliefs about beliefs. So we'll talk about that in the upcoming videos. So for the sake of this conversation, here's how we can work with assumptions and assumptions about assumptions. You need to do X to get Y. Well, that X, whatever it is, and replace it whatever you want, and we'll use some entrepreneurial examples here. So I get this a lot in consulting. As clients show up and they say, this book says I should do this, and this other person says I should do this, and this information says I should do this, and this training program says I should do this. It seems so confusing to me. And then we pause and I say, so you believe you need to do X in order to get Y? Do you realize that you don't need to do X to get Y? Or you may need to do X to get Y? Or you may not need to do X to get Y? And something happens. They release from mental rigidity. And then I say to them, what resonates with you? And they say, you know what? I'm getting that I want to do this other thing or a hybrid of what I learned or now I know what to do. And then I pause and I say, one of the things that I can do is interpret from my own perspective that what I commit to each day is maintaining my ideal state of mind, in which I call it flow. As a result of maintaining my ideal state of mind, which I do outside of our conversations while also in our conversation, I show up to these sessions in my ideal state of mind. And I assume that ideal state of mind to the level of what we would call unwavering lighthearted conviction as my self-image. So my assumption is when you show up, you're in the ideal state of mind. That's my assumption. Now, even if you show up with statements like you did, which is part of the consultation process narrative, I still recognize that you are in that state of mind and you'll reveal it to be so. Then they'll pause and they'll say, so I found the answer by going into the state of mind. I said, yes. Not only was it like that before and reflect back on your journey as it is for me, it is like that now, and it will always be like that. So then I move into contributing further to the conversations 
by adding some more assumptions and assumptions about assumptions. I said, and you can replace X and Y with whatever you'd like. I said, here's one. I pick if I want to do X or not to get Y because I know what works for me. That way, you'll find whatever X means to you and it'll resonate with you and you'll commit to it. And as part of this journey, as Bruce Lee said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. You'll practice that kick, you will start to see the results in part or in whole, and then you'll do it again and again and again and again. Not to say you'll always do that same thing, because again, we are lightening up the rigidity of mind, but you're also going to find what works for you, like Ray Dalio created his book, Principles, based on what works for him. And then I also share this one. I say, if X brings forth Y upon consistent use of X to get Y, then X works for me. And I'll share with you on my entrepreneurial journey, there are certain things that I do that consistently produces the leads, the clients, the business opportunities, the ability to see obstacle as an opportunity, the ability to convert a prospect into a client, the ability to figure out what to offer on the back end to increase lifetime client value. I've got all these rules in the mind that have been proven in equation again and again and again. And many of them are not found in these business courses or textbooks or business books. They may have parallels to that information and related in principle. But the specific moves that I make, the way I do it, is distinct to me. And I could teach you what they are. And they could work for you. But part of this journey is also finding what works for you. And again, to simplify this, love. Love is the way. As simple as it sounds, it really is that way. Because love, doing the loving thing, in your imagination or in this outer world brings you into a state of mind where all of these things I'm talking about make sense to you. And even though I put these formulaic expressions of how it works, it's really designed to bring a person into the ideal state of mind, to ease their mind. I call this heart and mind relationship. The heart desires, the mind creates. Neville says, when I speak of feeling, I do not mean emotion but acceptance of the fact that the desire is fulfilled brings you into a state. Dwell in the state. Feeling grateful, fulfilled, or thankful, it is easy to say, thank you, isn't it wonderful, or it is finished. So as mentioned earlier, the idea that creation is already finished eases up our mind and assumes our wish to be fulfilled a lot easier for many people, them saying, I don't know how I'm going to get from A to B. It seems like such a far journey, stressful journey. I'm going to have to do this. I need to do that. You're going to find out it's all going to happen unto and through you. You'll know what to do more so each day, know what to say more so each day, have faith. So this is something we've always known. We call this confidence. If I look back at my life, the times where I was excelling the most, people would say, you got a lot of confidence. And the times where I felt where I was at the effect of the world and things weren't going my way and I was stressed out, stuck in mental chatter, people would say to me, you need to level up your confidence. So confidence can also be looked at as assuming of the feeling of the wish fulfilled, knowing that it's done. Anytime that you speak to somebody who has confidence, they assume it to be done. And we're assuming love. So it's an accurate assumption of done, which is distinct from what we would call arrogance. Confidence is authentic. It's from a place of love. He says, when you get into a state of thankfulness, you can either awaken knowing it is done or fall asleep in the feeling of the wish fulfilled. And we refer to this as state akin to sleep. Because by assuming that feeling and falling asleep to that assumption, it impresses the subconscious mind and the fourth dimensional self hears it, also known as prayer. And he actually gives in one of his lectures, 
Someone asked him the question, what is the technique that he uses for prayer? So let's talk about this. In earlier stages of my life, because I was taught it, I work with prayer. However, I've deepened my understanding of prayer over the years. And so this particular format that he's talking about works really well. He says, it starts with desire. For desire is the mainspring of action. You must know and define your objective. Then condense it into a sensation which implies fulfillment, which can be words like prayer. He says, when your desire is clearly defined, immobilize your physical body and experience in your imagination, the action which implies it's fulfilled. Now you can couple that with prayer, see yourself doing the thing and saying a prayer that further affirms. And he says, repeat this act over and over again until it has the vividness and feeling of reality. Or condense your desire into a single phrase, prayer, that implies fulfillment such as, thank you, Father, isn't it wonderful? Or, it is finished. Repeat that condensed phrase or action in your imagination over and over again. Either one of them will work. I know because in earlier stages of my life, before I even knew about these things, I would pray and the prayers would be answered. But sometimes they would be answers and sometimes they would not be answered. But then upon working with how he communicates this and knowing that the prayer is heard and realizing that it is done, by knowing that it is done upon prayer, then you see it unraveling in the five sensory experience to the fulfillment of that experience, otherwise known as the bridge of incidents. Then either awaken from that state or slip off into the deep. It does not matter for the act is done when you completely accept it as being finished in that sleepy, drowsy state. One of the prayers that worked really well for me on my journey, which brought forth not just the desires, but also the ability to work with consciously the two gifts of speech and mind, is what I learned from Napoleon Hill. It's the O Divine Providence prayer, which goes, O Divine Providence, I ask not for more riches, but for more wisdom with which to make wiser use of the riches you gave me at birth, consisting in the power to control and direct my own mind to whatever ends I might desire. See, when I say a prayer like that, it resonates. It's easy for me to assume it as done. It brings me into a certain state of mind and easily allows me to drift into sleep, imagining whatever is in relation and in harmony to this particular prayer. So again, we want to remember, see this journey as your own creation, and you will realize that you are the one that is interpreting it. And you have the power to interpret it from the perspective of love, which is in relation and in harmony to what we truly desire, the heart desire. And everything in between is how we assume ourselves to be in relation to people, environment, circumstance, and information. And we have the power to change it. As he states, you can, by changing your concept of self, interfere with your future and mold it in harmony with your changed concept of self. If you want to copy this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.